You are listening to the Final Say Radio Show, a Rappaport Media production, with your host Brett Rappaport and co-host John Rappaport. Uh, we've got Congressman Steve King joining us from the great state of Iowa. And uh, Congressman, it's an absolute pleasure to have you back on the program. I know you guys have been extremely busy, and uh, how could you not be with all that's going on between not just Obamacare and uh, the, I guess, it, the, <laughs> uh, well, that's been quite a debacle, but we have quite a few other domestic but also uh, national security issues, I would call them, going on right now. Uh, so again, Congressman, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me back on, Brent and John. And uh, all of those topics out there are of great interest to me, and so I'm happy to go anywhere you'd like to go with this conversation. Sure. Well, if, if we can, and I don't want to spend too much time on it because it's already been covered so much, but I'd like to get a, a few comments on it. And, it, you know, we beyond the website, there's more to it than just the website. I mean, that's just a matter of being an embarrassment. But the fact is, and I know that you've been behind us since the very beginning along with us, that there are issues with the not only – the law itself, but the idea of government being involved in in another program that encompasses such a large piece of our economy, and then throw in that disturbing the doctor-patient relationship, and that's what we've been arguing this whole time. It's it's be, way beyond the website. That the, the the fundamental problems can't be fixed. Well, Brett, that's that's right, and I'm glad you phrased it that way. Way beyond the website is what I, I think the American people need to be thinking about. And in fact, the website may turn out to be a bit of a, a bit of a shield and a protection for the debacle that Obamacare appears to be. And uh, you know, I, I, I agree that, that with the way you look at this, I had a number of things that I don't think we've emphasized on nearly enough. And one of them is that the reasons for these premium increases that we have, and one of them is the community rating. Now, Iowa has a law that limits the the disparity between the cheapest premium and the most expensive premium to be five to one. I don't believe that we ought to have anything in place, but that was the mandate that they put in. And Obamacare reduces that community rating, that disparity rating from five to one in Iowa to three to one. Other states may have different standards that are out there. Uh, In fact, that may actually even be a federal standard, but it's reduced to three to one. So that means that the most healthy person, the youngest person, generally the person that is at the entry level of their of their earnings capacity in their early 20s it can pay no less than one-third of the highest premium charged. So you have that situation where um, you see the premiums increase, especially for young people at their lowest income capacity. Second one is uh, the language in Obamacare which says, and I'll just use biblical language, thou shalt not, quote, discriminate, close quote, against women in the premiums. Now, that means the winds are so – that doesn't say, though, that they can't discriminate against men. So in some of these categories, you'll, you'll never see a, a premium product, a prediction that shows a premium paid for a, a woman that's higher than a man in the same age category. But you will see it, higher than a man premium higher than a woman's premium in the same age category because there's no prohibition against discriminating against men, to use their terms. I don't think it's discrimination. I think it's the market's reflecting. You add to that, you add all of the mandates that are in there, the maternity, uh, people have been talking about the pediatric pediatric dental care, mental health, um, drug rehab. You can go on down the line, 10 or 12 of the mandates that are in that stacks up these premium increases and then does a wealth transfer again from the more senior people to the youngest low-income people that are the lowest risk. And it's not a lot different than what goes on in the policies that take place today between Social Security and Medicare from that perspective. That's a transfer from the income of the young to those that are older. And we have been, my generation, has been passing the, um, the burden of the costs of our standard of living off to the next generations. And I often say those children yet to be born. But now we have the children that have been born that are coming into the workplace are going to be paying the freight for the health insurance premiums of those that are older than they are who are of greater risk and of higher income on average. That's right. Now, when I look at this whole issue and I relate it to so many of the other issues that w- that we analyze, I look at it from, first, the constitutionality of it, and secondly, the cost of, of what's going on here and and who – what. What area is better managing it? I, I feel in most cases the public – I'm sorry, the private sector is a better manager. But when I look at this, I don't see how 
we have managed to control the cost in any way here, and I think I think it's very evident, and it'll become even more evident as this continues to roll out. But at, at, how, do, how does this administration explain that one? And and secondarily, uh, you know, we're all aware of how this was sold to begin with, and I, I don't know how, how, what you'd like to comment on that area, but I, I saw last night the president came out and you know it gave his best effort, I suppose of an apology to the American people. But one, do you think that was an apology, and do you think what he said was satisfactory? I think that what he said was calculated in the White House, and I think it was driven by his aides that said, you're losing it among the American people, Mr. President. You're going to have to do something to uh, fix the breach in the dam here where it's starting, to, it's starting to overflow. And so what we suggest you do is we'll write you this script, and um, you go on, Chuck Todd, and say to them that you're sorry that this happened to them, but don't say to them that you're actually sorry. You don't want to go that far. That would be that would be outside the character of this president. And I think that's what happened. I think it was a calculated move that was designed to uh, take some of the criticism away but change nothing and not take the blame for it either. And so I think about these promises that you brought up and talked about. Here's one of them that we haven't said very much about. He promised that, a typical family would have $2,500 in savings. Remember that? $2,500 yes. in savings. That has disappeared across the memory of the American people, that little promise. Now, you could maybe vote for Barack Obama if you thought he was going to cut your health care costs by $2,500 instead of it being something in, in, way above the opposite of that. Here, here's here's such a kind of a little mental list of $2,500 in savings to a typical family, gone. Big lie. Keep your doctor if you like him. Big lie gone. Keep your health plan gone. And by the way, he said he wasn't going to sign a bill that added one dime to the national debt. That was actually going to lower the national debt. Big lie. And he also said it wasn't a tax. Uh, but it wasn't a tax for the purposes of selling it to the American people, but it was a tax for the purposes of saving it from a Supreme Court decision. And now, of course, they have to embrace the idea that the no tax plan is a tax plan. And they also said it would hardly affect anyone and that doctors would love it. And, that's, and, it's, and he demonized the large insurance companies. And that was the reason why they said they had to pass Obamacare, because big, big insurance companies were victimizing the American people. You didn't have enough choices. He wanted to provide another choice for you out there that would be, traditionally, remember, a competing national health care policy that could go into the marketplace to compete against the private ones. He couldn't get that done um, because for political reasons. So... He just blames it on the insurance companies. And still, the talking points for Democrats over the last two weeks have been the reason your premiums are going up are because insurance companies are capitalizing on all of the doubt and the unknown and the indecision. So they're adding to the premiums and taking advantage of this like greedy capitalists, well, which we know is a lie. There is a limit written into Obamacare that insurance companies must pay out 80%, a minimum of 80% of their premiums that they collect into claims and they can use only 20% for administrative costs. So that's another lie. Um, and I, what I compared it to was, in my lifetime, I can remember the allegations of presidents and things. Richard Nixon accused of lying. He did. He lost his job over that. And then I'm, I'm going to skip through um, Reagan for, for good reason, and actually Jimmy Carter. I don't think Jimmy Carter came out and willfully lied. I don't think Reagan did, and I don't think it was a big issue. But when you got to George H.W. Bush, who said at the national convention, read my lips, no new taxes. Uh, then when he decided that he needed to accept the tax increase of $140 billion in order to get the spending cuts that never came, he came before the American people and said, I'm sorry I have to do this, but prudence dictates that I sign this bill. Well, he got, yes. of course, the tax increases, not the spending cuts, but he got accused of lying. Well, W. H. W. Bush did not lie. Bush 41 did not lie. But what he said, he didn't, he didn't keep his word. And that's a little bit different. And then, then go through, well, I don't need to dwell on Bill Clinton. Everybody knows how blatant that was. Uh, so skip through Monica Lewinsky and go to Bush 43, George W. But it was accused of lying in his State of the Union address you know, when he said that we have, the British have learned that the Iraqis are seeking uranium in Africa. That 16 words is how they characterized it. This was a lie that George Bush used that to go into war against Iraq. Well, I will tell you that I know, and I have in my possession, 
and certainly had my hands on the now declassified but still redacted CIA debrief of Ambassador Joe Wilson who went to Africa to determine whether the Iraqis were seeking yellow cake uranium and came back and told the CIA, yes, they are, I have proven it. And for some reason, Ambassador Joe Wilson did a 180 and spent four years, he and Valerie Plame calling George W. Bush a liar when the record shows that it was Joe Wilson who was a liar, not George W. Bush. So there's been a high penalty for things that were inaccurate. Even if they were actually true, they get accused of lying, there was a high penalty for it. Now, you have a president who has been multiple times uh, uttered a calculated lie to the American people, and after he is found out because the because of what's happened with the implementation, then mm-hmm. he tried to cover it up with another lie. He said, what we said was that if you have if your policy didn't change after the bill took effect, then you can keep it. You know, they never said that. That's another lie, a lie on top of a lie, and the consequence for this needs to be high. Or history is history is going to read this thing, I think, and I think he's branded forever with it. Brett. That's right, uh, Congressman. I, I I think you said some very key things here. Uh, one is I'm glad that you brought up the difference between what Bush had said with the no new taxes and, and the comparison to uh, President Obama. The other thing is the 80 uh, percent payments from 80 uh, percent of the uh, what the insurance companies bring in have to go out, and that's important, and that should be said more often. I'm glad you did. The other thing is I would say that I, I'm pretty sure that some of these chemical weapons that are in Syria right now came from Iraq. And I'll finish up th- this before John asks a very important question on uh, with regards to the foreign policy. If the president was serious about an apology, instead of going to Chuck Todd, he would have come on the final, say, radio show where he would get asked legitimate questions. Anyway, John, go ahead mm-hmm. and take over. Okay. I agree. John. Well, uh, Congressman, uh, moving from the health of our people to the health of our uh, nation, and, you know, I'm, I'm happy to ask this question to you because I consider you one of the few true conservative stalwarts we have in Congress. And I'm, as a father, I'm, I'm greatly concerned about where we're heading here. I, I believe five years of failed foreign policy under Obama, my words, not yours, uh, I wanted to know whether you believe that nuclear arms containment is still even possible with Iran. And inclusive in that question is the background of a uh, not-so-quiet nuclear arms race uh, that is being prepared all over the place in the Middle East, including weapons that uh, Pakistan has apparently already uh, quietly sold <laughs> or contracted uh, through the Saudis, uh, and inclusive of Russia uh, now being uh, apparently uh, going to build a, a major naval base in Egypt and become a major arms supplier in Egypt. You put all these things together, uh, wh- where do we go? Are we too far gone? I don't, you know, we're never too far gone, I don't think, as long as there is an America and a spirit of God-given liberty that we have, John. But to really, it, it, starting in on the, especially the Middle Eastern policy, just sets me off that to see what's happened. Um, and then I dial this thing back to shortly after Obama became president. This is still Middle Eastern policy. He canceled the missile defense system in Poland and the radar system in Czechoslovakia. And the headline in the Warsaw paper the next day said one big bold word, betrayed. And I've been over there since then. And I can tell you they still feel betrayed by this president and they do not trust him. And they've got another three-plus years of him to deal with. That's Poland and Czechoslovakia. That shield was a shield that protected uh, Europe and Israel and others from uh, a potential nuclear strike coming out of Iran, not out of Russia. That's, that's the start of this. And then the president also he made the statement that he believed that Israel should go back to 1967 boundaries. And that would mean then that Israel would have to give up part of Jerusalem and uh, they would have to give up different components that they have won, or the West Bank could be one of them, uh, within the 67 war, the 73 war, they would be uh, an indefensible nation from a tactical perspective if they went back to those boundaries. That weakened Israel as well. And each, each time that Israel rattled the saber to try to, to try to fend off the, I'll say, the threats that come from their all-threatening neighbors, we had something, the president would do something that would weaken Israel a little longer and, and tone them down. And then, let me see, I'll go through um, Egypt. And I was in Egypt uh, right over the, right near the Labor Day weekend, 
spent a, a other parts of the Middle East too, and we dealt with Syrians, we dealt with Libyans that were refugees, and then met with the interim president of Egypt in one meeting, the president El- or I mean, uh, General Al Sisi, the commander of the military, and a meeting right behind that, and a third meeting right behind that was with the Coptic Pope of the Coptic Church in, in Egypt. We had those were the highest level meetings, the three highest you could have in Egypt, all back to back, and then. We had many meetings that went on early in the morning and late at night, some clandestine, some not, but people that had been on the ground that we knew and trusted that put this all into perspective. Remember that Barack Obama gave a speech in Cairo to the Muslim world, is what it was designed to be, June 9th of 2009. In the front row, he seated the leadership of the Muslim Brotherhood. The Muslim Brotherhood had been outlined by, by Mubarak, and so that sent the message throughout Egypt that and the Arab world, that Barack Obama supported the Muslim Brotherhood. Shortly thereafter, Morsi rose to power. They deposed Mubarak. Morsi rose to power partly on the push that came from Barack Obama. Morsi, the face, the voice, and the strong arm power of Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. And they set about closing down the opportunity to ever have an election again in Egypt. And so then... The people were up, rose up to the streets, and over 30 million of them came to the streets. Population of 80 to 83 million in Egypt, over 30 million came to the streets to demonstrate in a generally peaceful way to move Morsi out. And they pleaded with the military to help them. They finally did. They moved Morsi out. Now he's been arrested, along with many of the leaders of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. Barack Obama was completely on the wrong side of that. Oh, and also... When Mubarak was still in power, after the president's speech in Cairo, you had Hillary Clinton, then Secretary of State, say, Mubarak needs to be gone yesterday. And that's a quote. Mubarak needs to be gone yesterday, close quote. Well, that rocketed through the Egyptian world. They didn't know why Barack Obama was supporting Muslim Brotherhood. They still don't know why. And now that the Muslim Brotherhood has been deposed, Morsi and others, and the voice of the Egyptian people is being heard, and they're setting up for a constitutional election and an election uh, to put a civilian government in place. I, and General Sisi looked me in the eye and said, I will, and our military will, submit to a civilian command for our military, just as we are in this country. That's the right direction. So Egypt, the, the, if you figured that 100% of the bonds that we had with Egypt, that, that, was, that was our baseline when Barack Obama became president. I will tell you directly out of the heart of Egypt, people I know and trust that know that policy, they say 98% of our relationship with Egypt has been destroyed by, by the Barack Obama administration. So, And, there, and Egypt is, is essential to any relationship we have throughout the Middle East, going east and west of, of, of Egypt, all across the Mediterranean, all the way across uh, over to Pakistan. And so that's what he's done with Egypt in Syria. He got on the wrong side of the issue, and it really took Putin to save him and that, that has saved his policy to some degree in Syria, at least delayed it for now. But the, but the price for that is that Putin gets stronger, the Russians get stronger, and they build their relationships with Egypt to, to mount this effort that you talked about in Egypt. Their influence in the Middle East is stronger. Their influence in Saudi Arabia is stronger. We have lost a tremendous amount with the foreign policy fumblings and bumblings, and now the, the very survival of Israel is at stake. And I want to say to the American people, and I hope that a message echoes across to the Israelis and Benjamin Netanyahu, if Israel, I think right now, has been forced into the situation where they will have to militarily strike Iran's nuclear capability, if they can still pull that mission off. And and other than that, they have to draw a conclusion. Here's this. Barack Obama will never order a military strike against Iran's nuclear capability. He will never do that. And we should know that. We should have known that two or three years ago, and I think I did. Now it's absolutely confirmed. And so the Israelis have to conclude, can they survive another three years and without a nuclear strike on them from Iran? And if so, will America elect a president that will eliminate Iran's then existing nuclear capability, future existing nuclear capability and and delivery system? I say if you're Benjamin Netanyahu and a wise Knesset, you would say, we have no choice now. We've got to do, we've got to order a military strike to knock out Iran's military capability. So I want to send this message to the Israelis. If you do that, I stand with you. Much of the United States Congress stands with you. And even though I don't expect the president will, 
uh, we're we're going to stand with Israel. So that's that's how it sounds. That's how it is to me, and that's how I see it from my perspective. There's more I would say about it, but it is a is that it is a debacle of foreign policy from Poland to Czechoslovakia to all the way through the Middle East into Iraq, Iran, Saudi Arabia, uh, and clear over to Afghanistan and Pakistan. You couldn't have painted this scenario much worse unless you just painted it as a nuclear war going on. And we know it's a nuclear arms race in the Middle East, John. No, that's absolutely right. Uh, Congressman, I, I, we're going to end it on that because I don't think there's anything else we could say that's uh, any more important than the statement you just made. And I think that most Americans stand behind Israel. I don't know where this president's head is or John Kerry or maybe even Hegel for that matter. But uh, it, it's a very, very difficult situation that our friends in Israel find themselves in. And by the way, just uh, before we let you go, John and I just got back from Israel. We spent two and a half weeks there. Well, he was actually there for three. We went all over the entire country and saw every strategic uh, uh, um, landmark, if you will, and recognized clearly how dangerous it would be to return, or, or not return, but to give up any land to anyone for that matter. It is totally against the natural national security interest of Israel and could be detrimental to that nation, and they can't do it. John, you're right. Once you see that, you can't draw another conclusion. Once you stand on that military outpost and uh, you see the, the road sign that says so many kilometers to Damascus, so many to Jerusalem, uh, you start looking around there and you realize how, how tight and how compact that is. They only have seconds to react to defend themselves. They have to do preemptive action. So I'm glad you've seen it. That makes a big difference when you've been there on that ground. It, it sure does. So uh, people can check you out at um, – is it King? SteveKing.com. SteveKing.com. Okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Congressman, it's a pleasure as always. We wish you uh, luck, and we know that you will continue to fight not just for your district but for the American people. For the American people, God and country, and the state and district in that order. Thank you so much, John and Brett. Okay, take it easy. Bye. Uh, another uh, excellent, excellent interview with the congressman. Just very thoughtful and important things that he had to share with us.